Good morning, everybody. Hello, hello. We're starting to join now. Hi there, Palinda. Morning from Thailand. Hi, Lika. Hi, Jane. Abelard. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Alicia, hello, good morning. And Katrina and Phoebe. <laughs> and Dina, hello. Dina or Dina? I'm assuming Dina. Roberto, good morning. Hi, hey, Lizelle. Jonalyn. Dr. Edward, hello. <laughs> So good morning, everybody. Welcome. We're just uh, opening the doors, letting people in. We will actually start the webinar in about 10 minutes, but we're just getting set up, getting organized. Hi there, Shirley. Morning, David. Morning, Vicente. Yurlilin. Kezang and Donna from the Philippines, David from Vietnam. Nice to see everybody this morning. Hey there, Rafa from Japan. Nice to see you. Loisa, hello. Uh, Kazang's from Bhutan, nice. We haven't, uh, we haven't had many attendees from Bhutan, I can say that for certain. <laughs> so welcome, Kizang. Yeah, we have quite a few people from the Philippines. Han, nice to see you from Vietnam. Hi, Namisha from India, hello, welcome. Yeah, we have people from uh, predominantly Asia joining us. Um, but as we can see, we've got Namisha from India, we've got Gazang from Bhutan. We've got people from lots of different places um, joining us. We, we have some people occasionally joining us from uh, Central Asia, Southern Asia, sometimes even Europe and Africa. So, ah, Vicente's in Thailand, nice. From the Philippines, but working in Thailand. Well, I'm from New Zealand, but working in Taiwan. So, <laughs> hi, Tran Lam from Vietnam, Rex from the Philippines. Very nice. Nice to see everybody. Hi, Alicia from Guyana. Nice, cool. Guyana, sorry. Working in Japan. Dr. Edwards in Malaysia. My brother in law is from Malaysia, actually. He's from Ipo. So nice to see everyone this morning. And here's my colleague, Kitty, joining us. Good morning, Kitty. Morning, Andrew. How are you today? I'm good. That's good. That's good. Yeah, I, I, I didn't know whether you, 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 you're in the room or, or not, because when yeah. I try to join, it says, yeah, sign in to start. Ah, right, uh, yes. So, yeah. It's that Zoom yeah. problem sometimes, that's right. <laughs> I don't mess up anything. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we had that problem one time where we got locked out from our own right. webinar. <laughs> well, we got a lot of people here today, Kitty. We got people from Japan and Vietnam and Thailand and Malaysia. And someone from Bhutan, right. someone from India. People from all over. But yeah, we'll get started in about uh, five minutes. So we'll see how everyone goes today and what you think of making people, or what makes a person smart. Not making people smart, that's a little different. <laughs> I think that's called education. <laughs> anyway, hi there, Arlene. Lots of people here already. I know there'll be a few more still coming. 
Hi, Ivy. Very good. It's nice to see so many people here. So interesting picture in the, uh, in the background here, right? What's going on there? <laughs> Hi there, is it Nhi Nhi from Vietnam, Hanoi? And then, yeah, is it Rachel or Rochelle? I'd say it's Rochelle from Phonetics, Jawe. Nice to see you too. Oh, Colin, okay, radio. A Filipina living in Japan, nice. Mary Ann, hello, and Rex. Two Rexes today. Ah, in Bangkok, cool. Hi, Sammy, nice to see you again. And Trin, Trin Vu. Sorry, Thin Vu, excuse me. I need my glasses on, <laughs> I can't read the text. <laughs> I do wear glasses. Not, uh, I only wear them for reading usually. So you could put them on and look perhaps a little more academic. <laughs> we won't worry about them for now. I need them for books and sometimes with my phone. But uh, by and large, I get by without them. I find these pictures interesting, like this one that's on the screen at the moment, because glasses make a person look smart. <laughs> it's like instant intelligence, just add glasses. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> mm. um, yeah, so in the background here, it's like, I'm always interested by, it's, it, this is all a very technical device, but if you look at the background or the, the pieces in the kind of holding the device together, you can see like tape and things like this, it always, it always, I used to do this too, because I was a researcher when I was younger, uh, working in labs and things. And uh, yeah, it's interesting how it's kind of all just kind of put together to make it work, <laughs> right? It doesn't look very polished sometimes. That's the nature of research. Yeah. Very good. Uh, Kitty, just the regular links today. Yeah. Nothing fancy today. Okay, <laughs> Rex, Rex, you're uh, not posting to everybody, but it says, yeah, Rex just said, if you wear glasses, he says, I would ask Clark, Clark Kent, no. <laughs> no, that's not my alter ego. <laughs> yeah, it does look a bit like a sci-fi movie poster, this one, doesn't it, Sammy? Hi, morning, Cherry. Yeah, it is a little bit sci-fi, isn't it? But the funny thing about science fiction is it's kind of like future fact sometimes. Hi there, Rose. Rosemary. Very good. Well, let's uh, let's quickly walk through the, the housekeeping anyway, as we just wait for one or two more people to join. Um, so just a reminder, there's a couple of people I've noticed uh, with their chat settings still set to the upper of the two options. You want to be on the bottom of the two options. So either everyone or all panelists and attendees, depending on which version of Zoom you're using. Um, so if you do that, then people can see what you're typing. I noticed like Sammy, for example, you were still on hosts and panelists, okay? Um, and second one, we'll be using the Q&A function today. Uh, we will use it for the regular uh, question and answers like we normally do, but also we're going to do an activity today that will use the Q&A feature to run the activity. So make sure you um, see where that is in your, in your Zoom uh, options um, should be next to the chat button, chat box button, and we'll get into uh, um, you know using that feature later on. Yes, Kitty, we'll get to that in a second. Okay, cool. Um, so, without further ado, just to get started. So, most of you, well, not most of you, some of you know me. My name's Andrew. Uh, I'm a senior academic consultant from National Geographic Learning. I've done a lot of teaching over the years. You can see I'm not so young. Um, but I just want to learn a little bit about you before we get started. So let's quickly uh, open the poll. 
just on the segments like we normally do, just to, just to get an idea of who's here today. Oopsie, why am I getting things on my phone? Let me turn that off. Okay, hi Janda. Janda or Yanda? Might be Yanda. Okay, so today we have quite a lot of people who are here, if I end the poll and share the results there. Um, yeah, quite a lot of people who are young learners, teachers or teens. Um, today's program is a teens program and I'll explain a little bit more about it in a second. Um, but yeah, uh, some of this, some of this kind of these ideas would still be applicable if you're teaching older students as well, because um, this program is uh, a kind of program used by bilingual schools, international schools, or that kind of school where you're doing a lot more literacy and content um, in your program. For very young learner teachers today, um, maybe some of the examples won't be exactly applicable, but I hope you get some good ideas out of today anyway. Okay, very good. Okay, so I'll stop sharing that. Let's close that. And before we get started, I'm just going to turn on the Facebook live stream. So if you just give me one moment here, uh, just turn this on live on Facebook. Let's quickly set this up and then we'll make a start for today. Share to your page, go live, there we go. Okay, give it one second, got it. One second, just waiting for Facebook to catch up. It just takes 10 seconds or so. And we're away. Good, okay. So good morning, everyone. And let's take a look at what we're doing today with this program uh, called Lift. Um, and we're talking, um, oh, sorry, I'm sharing the wrong screen. Um, and we're talking about, oh no, I am sharing the right screen. There we go. Um, we're talking about what makes a person smart today. Um, but just to explain this program that we're talking about, Lyft, a little bit more, uh, this is a content-based English program, which means that it is very heavy on the content, on the academic ideas behind things, as well as the English that goes along with that. So similar to how in some situations you use English to teach content, here we're doing some of that because we are uh, looking at content pretty heavily, but this is still an English program where the primary focus is on helping our students improve their English. And we do that through a literacy based approach and it's designed for young teens, this program. So it's 12 to 15 years old, kind of grade six, um, seven, eight, nine, that kind of range um, of student uh, would work well with this kind of program because of the amount of literacy in it. Okay. Um, and it does focus on teaching academic content uh, and academic language, as well as working with literacy, but all in the service of improving students' English, okay? Uh, it is a fairly heavy program. I'll show you through um, all of the pages in a unit. We're only going to scratch the surface today. Um, it does rely on quite a few teaching hours per week uh, to teach this program completely because there is quite a lot of reading, uh, quite a lot of analysis of reading. Um, and also development of writing skills that go on in this program as well, okay? And so in one unit, uh, which might take four to five weeks, uh, you've got about 65 pages of content to go through. So that's quite a lot, right? Uh, which is obviously why we need a fair amount of time um, in class to be able to cover all that kind of material, okay? Now, in terms of why this kind of program exists, it's really designed for this kind of aspiring global learner, international school, bilingual school kind of student or situation, right? And this is just a little bit of information from the ISC research group, um, which shows that the, the shifting landscape of this kind of education is moving quite rapidly. So 20 years ago, there was a thousand um, English language international schools worldwide, but today there's now 8,000. Um, and the type of students that are going to these schools are now a lot more from the host country. So for example, in Vietnam, if you've got a Vietnamese international school, it could be that three quarters or more of the students are Vietnamese, okay, wanting to learn in this kind of style. And it's estimated that this will double uh, in the next 10 years. We will have as twice as many again um, international schools. So obviously there's a big need for this type of um, education style and education curriculum, okay? Um, and it is the idea that Students are wanting to attain academic success in English. This is something that students today, more and more students are wanting to do. 
And it depends on developing a lot of different skills to be able to meet the demands of our globalized society. Okay, but also the model for the way we've taught uh, has traditionally been one way, but we need to shift that way a little bit to support learners who are still developing their skills in language and English, um, as well as in some of those academic areas as well. So this is kind of why this kind of program exists and why we uh, approach it in this particular way as we look at today. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to switch over to the classroom presentation tool that we use to teach this kind of material. Uh, I need to find it. Here it is. And let's take a look through. I'm going to go through uh, quite a few examples. I'll basically be the teacher. You can act, interact with me like students and we'll see how we go. Okay, so on the screen right here in front of us, what sort of things do you see? This is kind of an interesting picture, right? What do you see here? What does this look like? What do you see? In the chat box, let me know what you see. Interconnection, wow, yes. Books, you see books? Someone wearing a mind detecting cap, okay. Lots of microchips, yeah. A thinking hat, uh, some sort of brain science. Yeah, a helmet. Yeah, what is this thing, right? If we zoom in, a cyborg, oh, that's interesting, a cybernetic organism, right? If we zoom in, then what we can see is we've got lots of these little green um, circuits here, right? These are small integrated circuits. Um, there's a chip in the middle here, the black thing is, is a chip, and then everything else is controlled electronics. Um, and each of those seems to be plugged in down at the bottom here to some sort of sensor. And I can tell that this sensor here, uh, it's an electromagnetic sensor. Okay, it's detecting electromagnetism that's going on below the surface of the sensor, okay? Uh, the reason I know this is because I studied physics at university, okay? Um, but this is, this person, they seem fairly calm and comfortable here, um, but obviously there's something going on here. Um, and we've got a couple of questions over here. Uh, it says, why is this person wearing, wearing a helmet of sensors? So why do you think they might be wearing this helmet? Why, what's the purpose here? What's the purpose of what's happening here? If you look at the second question, yeah, to understand how the brain works, says Rochelle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Monitoring and data collection. Yep. It's studying the brain. It's a neurological experiment. That's a, that's a nice word, Joe. Yeah, neurological to do with the brain. Um, yep. Check one's capacity. Yeah, sure. To upgrade the brain, maybe. Yeah. I think, Yuyin, this is uh this is a sensor rather than a plug-in device, right? It's not something that's uh enhancing the brain, it's measuring the brain, okay? Yeah, some sort of experiment going on, right? So yeah, what's happening here, as it says down the bottom in the caption, it says a helmet of sensors helps scientists understand how people learn. Okay, so maybe they're giving this person um, something to look at or a video or a book or something. And as that person is reading or learning or watching, then they're recording what's happening inside the brain perhaps, right? Yeah, there could be lots of things going on here. Um, question two, if you were studying the human brain, what question would you like to research first? What would you like to learn about the human brain? If you were one of these brain scientists and neurologist, neurological scientist, is there a soul? That's an interesting one. How do humans learn? The, yeah, how our memory works and memorizing power, nice questions, yeah. How students react to visual stimuli, nice. Dreams, nice Emma, I like that one, yeah. The lifespan of the brain, yeah, because our brains, like our bodies, change over time, right? That's interesting. Acquisition skills for language, yeah. Processing function within our brains, wow, so many comments coming in here. Uh, can the human brain 100% be used, Sammy? That's a really interesting one. Um, there is a movie. Um, have you seen the movie Lucy? Uh, it talks about some of those ideas. It's got Scarlett Johansson and Morgan Freeman, and it's a good movie. Um, yeah, Marlo knows what I'm talking about. Nice. So, yeah, there's lots of different things we could study, right, in this, with this device, perhaps, to help us understand what's going on inside the brain and how it's working. Okay. And up at the top of the page here, uh, we've got a quote from Albert Einstein, the theoretical physicist. The measure of intelligence is the ability to change. How do you feel about that question, uh, that quote? 
the measure of intelligence is the ability to change. What do you think about that? Do you agree? Do you feel yes, no? It's interesting, it's no, he's wrong. You agree, okay, so why? More importantly is why. You adapt to survive, says Manelli, yeah? Okay, the brain is the master gland, it's the one that controls everything, yeah? Agree, but not completely. Intelligence, okay, so Evora says intelligence may be overt and covert, interesting, right? Okay, yeah, it could be shown and also somewhat hidden, yeah? Change is inevitable, says Marie, so does that mean intelligence is inevitable? Mm. <laughs> how we adapt to change measures how intelligent we are, says Liberty. Yeah, maybe, right? Okay, so we could spend some time with our students talking about this idea quite a lot because this plays into what we call in this program, uh, we call an essential question. And so if I go to the next page, one of the essential questions we're going to look at in this particular uh, unit and the one we're going to focus on today is what is intelligence? In each of these units, there are three um, essential questions. We only have time to deal with one very briefly today. But what is intelligence? What does it mean to have intelligence or to be intelligent? What does that mean, right? So we're gonna explore that question a little bit. Uh, Gary, uh, just to answer your question really quickly, this is level one of Lyft, which was designed for like 12 to 13 year old students, grade six to seven. Okay, uh, assuming they're at sort of some sort of bilingual or quasi international school. Okay, so Gary, if you've got more questions about that, we can chat about it later. Okay, but yeah, that's that's just briefly that's the level. Okay, so actually, the way I'm speaking with you right now as this audience is very, very similar to the way I would speak with my students about all of these things we're talking about today. Um, the exception would be by knowing my class, I might tailor my language a little, right? So I might simplify some phrases or slow down a little bit. But apart from that, uh, the things I'm talking about with you today would be the same uh, ideas that I would uh, speak with my students about. Okay, nice. So intelligence, what I'm going to do is, uh, so we've got somewhere to write, I'm just going to switch screens to my OneNote here, uh, which is the same, same activity, but we're going to write on this one as we go. So uh, if we just, in, in single words, perhaps, what does it mean to be intelligent? Let's fill in a couple of these, um, these uh, boxes here. Um, to be intelligent, what does it mean to be intelligent? What's some things or phrases or words we could say about intelligent? Okay, so being creative, maybe. Okay, cool, to be curious. Yeah, I like that one too. Nice, the ability to think, okay. Ability to think, okay, and by thinking you mean considering things, right, yeah, to understand something, okay, to understand something that's going on around you, maybe understand the implication of it, to think critically, yeah, let's put that one up here with creative, okay, um, adaptability, okay, and maybe for that one, adaptability, um, maybe it's conscious adaptability rather than unconscious it's not just accidental adaptability but maybe we'll put in here conscious as well right conscious adaptability um higher order thinking skills okay cool um to reflect i like that one as well okay so there's a lot of different things that we could say what does it mean to be intelligent and there's no one correct answer at this stage right we just give our students this opportunity to think about it for themselves now Here's another question. What are some examples of intelligence? How do you see intelligence play out in the real world, right? How do we see intelligence happen? Okay, so an ability to relate and empathize with someone. I like that one. We'll just put a few up here, empathize. Okay, so yeah, we see it in terms of different styles of intelligence, kinesthetic, linguistic, mathematical, so kind of theories of intelligences, maybe from Gardner or something similar. IQ and EQ, yeah, let's put that one up here as well. Um, and some people also talk about socio-emotional. Um, so uh, whereas EQ maybe is a little bit more about yourself, this one's more about socio-emotional, like working with others perhaps as well, okay? Um, school tests, okay, maybe, yeah. So examples of intelligence are getting, getting A plus on your tests. Sure, why not, right? 
Um, oh, I like this one. The acceptance of criticism. Okay. If you can accept criticism, maybe that shows your intelligence. Nice. Yeah. Okay. So we've got a lot of oh, humor. Yeah, that's another one as well. Humor is an example of, an, of intelligence, like being able to interpret the hidden meaning in a joke or the double meaning in something, right? Yeah, totally. So these are all good examples of the idea of intelligence, right? Okay, so let's jump back. We're doing this fairly quickly because we, we've got a lot of material in this book and I wanna give you a good kind of sample of everything here. Now we could get our students to write about this and this is an important uh, part of the process of learning this unit is here you can see at the bottom of the screen, it says write one or two sentences to respond to the essential question of, back up the top here, what is intelligence, okay? And actually, the students write down their ideas now, and then they do some learning, and then at the end, they reconsider the same question. And they say, so what do I think about this now? And they can see how their views or ideas have changed on this subject, okay? Cool. But what I want to do now is we're gonna just move over here uh, and start to learn a few words, right? So as we go through this, there's a lot of uh, vocabulary um, and language support, specifically vocabulary, but all, all forms of language, grammar and other things as well, writing and other skills. Um, but uh, learning more academic vocabulary is important for students to develop the ability to deal with more content, right? Um, and so here we've got a half dozen academic vocab words, um, analyze, complex, design, expert, focus, and predict. And we've got a short, uh, reading here, which is using examples of the words, but it's also on the topic of this particular uh, subject. So let's take a quick look. Uh, I'll just read it out really quickly. In a recent study, 979 experts, including scientists, researchers, and business leaders, shared their thoughts on computer-based intelligence. The study was designed to answer the question, will computer-based intelligence make our lives better? The easy answer, yes, of course, they said. Much more than that though. Some experts focused on the positives that may come from computer-based intelligence, such as complex decision-making, okay? Others focused on solving serious problems. If a computer program could analyze and solve world hunger, the world would be a better place. Everyone didn't see this technology positively though. Some experts predicted computer-based intelligence might result in fewer jobs for people. Okay, so then what we could do is we could actually talk about this topic a little bit, right? And um, we could do it now, but actually later on in this unit, which we won't see today, um, there is actually a, uh, a whole section devoted to this idea of computer-based intelligence or artificial intelligence um, and what we could do with it. But what I might ask my students here is, we, okay, we've got the six highlighted words and a little activity about those we'll look at in a moment. But apart from those six words, are there any other words here that students might want to know more about or they're not clear on? I always like to check with them, which words are you not, or phrases do you not know so well? So just think for your students, um, what, what words or phrases here would your students perhaps have some difficulty with or lack of knowledge on? Okay, so maybe researchers, computer-based intelligence, yeah, sure. Maybe technology, yeah, okay. Um, so how would we introduce those to our students? How would we let them know what they mean, right? Um, so one way is to talk about examples, obviously. So we could say, well, computer-based intelligence is when you ask your computer to make some decisions about something. You don't tell it what to do. You ask your computer to make a decision. So you say, computer, should this be red or blue? You decide, right? So how does the computer do that, right? Does the computer have a brain? And we could talk about this idea a little bit, right? Um, and at the end of the day, actually, computer-based intelligence, we might have to share with them, it's a, it's a very long and complicated program that the computer runs to try and figure out the answer, okay? Um, and so the program is written by people, but then the computer is thinking, somehow, right? Is it really thinking or is it just following rules that we made up for it? Okay. Okay. And so we could go through and talk about some of these ideas. Um, if it's a word like researchers, maybe we can um, think about people our students might know who are researchers, right? Um, or, or scientists or something like that, maybe from um, someone famous locally, right? Um, in, in the local uh, national community. Who they know who was a researcher from the news or something like that okay 
Um, but yeah, there's some interesting words in here that we could talk about. Now, there's a quick little activity. We'll just do this one really fast uh, for the vocabulary here. Um, so we've got six words. Uh, one of them's already filled in. It's got a definition here. Um, and six words, expert is a person with a high level of skill or knowledge in a subject. So you could say perhaps that I'm an expert in National Geographic learning programs because I work with them all the time. Um, I wouldn't say I'm an expert on physics, but maybe I could say I'm an expert on teaching high school physics because I've done a lot of that before. Okay, cool. Now, what about uh, these other words? So what about the second one here? To study something carefully in order to understand it. Analyze, we think, okay, great. Okay, to say something will happen in the future based on knowledge or experience. This one would be predict, nice. To give special attention to someone or something would be to focus, thank you. To plan or develop something for a specific purpose. To design, nice, and then, oops, oh, sorry. And then made of many parts and difficult to understand is complex. Now, and again, I might uh, do a little bit more with these words. We might say, what are some similar words here, right? So design could be something. What about invent? Is that the same, right? Or to create, right? Is that is that similar to design? Um, or complex, and then there's another word like complicated, right? What's the similarity or differences between those two words, right? And then maybe we can check the dictionary and figure these things out. And this way we can expose our students to a few more words rather than just these ones, right? We can give them some extra words that they can use maybe in their writing or maybe we'll run into them in the, in the, the readings as we go through, okay? But yeah, always good to stretch our students' vocabulary. Um, these words will pop up in the reading, um, but also maybe we can expose our students to some other ones as well. Okay, and I think, yes, we're good. We got all those right because there's no red crosses there. We're good. Nice. So let's jump back to here. Um, now, I have uh, something before we go on to the next page. Oh, actually, let me just jump to the next page. Um, we've got something here about the ideas about making, uh, what makes someone smart, okay? Now, before we do this, though, I want to take a look at some little pieces of reading right, uh, some little bits of a story. Uh, and we're gonna take a look and see what, uh, what we think about these things. Does this show someone is intelligent or smart or not, right? Okay, so <laughs> procrastination makes someone smart, says Marlo, okay. So I've got some little pieces, little passages from a text. I want you to take a look at these and let me know what you think, okay? And what we'll do is, um, before I show you the first one, we're gonna say, uh, we're going to do it on a spectrum, right? And we're going to say, this seems like someone who's very smart or very intelligent, okay? And this is not, okay? So we're going to say from zero up to five, okay? From zero to five. And you can just put zero to five in the chat box when we do this, okay? So here's the first little passage, okay? Uh, you see a girl with dark brown eyes, but one of them is slightly out of whack. Her head wobbles a little, sometimes she drools. Her body tends to move of its own agenda, with feet sometimes kicking out unexpectedly and arms occasionally flailing, connecting with whatever's close by. A stack of CDs, a bowl of soup, a vase of roses. Not a whole lot of control there. Okay, does this seem to indicate someone who's smart or intelligent? What do you think? Zero to five, there's no wrong answer. We're not judging anybody based on your answer. Okay, we got a three, we got a two, we got a three, a two, a zero, a one. Okay, so I, I know some of you might be saying, well, it doesn't, maybe it's like, I don't know, does it, this doesn't seem to be any sort of displayed intelligence here, does it, right? So you might be not sure what to do for this particular one, right? Okay, why well, it's put a five, that's interesting. Okay, so we're gonna look at another one really quick. Let's go down to here. At age five, I knew all the colors and shapes and animals that my that children of my age are supposed to know, plus lots more. In my head, I could count to a thousand, forward and backward. I could identify hundreds of words on sight at age five. Okay, so yeah, uh, Odin, the last one was about physical characteristics. Okay, so we've got lots of fives popping up here. Four, three, <coughs> Or five. Okay, so we got, so at age five to know those things, you consider that person smart. Okay, but as they age, probably the benchmark changes, right? 
Okay. Yeah. Or the family is just well off, says Rochelle, maybe. Indicative of a particular type of intelligence, says Yanda, right? Okay, interesting. Okay. Okay, one more. Last one. I saw a special on PBS once, Public Broadcasting Service, TV, okay, on children who are geniuses. These kids could remember complicated strands of numbers and recall words and pictures in correct sequence and quote long passages of poetry. So can I. I remember the toll-free number from every infomercial, the mailing address, and the websites too. If I ever need a new set of knives or the perfect exercise machine, I've got that information on file. I know the names of the actors and actresses of all the shows, what, what time each program comes on, which channel, and which shows are repeats. I even remember the dialogue from each show and the commercials in between. Sometimes I wish I had a delete button in my head. Okay, so is this... Zero to five, is this indicative of someone being smart? Okay, we got fours and fives again. Okay, interesting, yep. Photographic memories, says Lionel, yes. Lionel, sorry. Okay, so we got some, again, people saying different things, right? Um, someone had an interesting comment, I'm just scrolling back up to read it. Um, Okay, so yes, looking looking at like measuring an action and predicting what comes out of that, right? Oops. Um, ah, Jawai says, I'm starting to feel that maybe all the paragraphs talk about the same individual. Why are you starting to feel that, Jawai? <laughs> we'll find out, shall we? <clears throat> Interesting, right? Uh, maybe these maybe these second two are linked, right? What about the first one? Okay, we'll find out shortly. Okay, so <clears throat> we're going to jump back to here and let's have a think about these factors that we can see here. So these are a little bit more traditional kind of factors that we might take into account when we consider intelligence or being smart. Um, look through the seven there. Uh, I just want you to pick, just for the sake of now because we've only got the chat box, just pick the one that you think is your top rank for showing that someone's smart or making someone smart. What's the top ranked item you have here? So Gary says, being curious, so does Mayan. Okay, lots of people saying being curious, becoming an expert in something, okay. Lots of people saying being curious, nice. Reading, says Edward, okay. Yeah, acting your age, says Rochelle, interesting. Being a doctor, okay, or a lawyer which I guess is also becoming an expert. You could say being a doctor and lawyer also relates to becoming an expert about something, right? Yeah, okay. So we've got some different ideas. Now there is no one correct answer here. These are, maybe you could look at it as different ways of being a smart or in your opinion, what matters more, okay? Um, but yeah, we've got some different opinions here. Um, watching TV make you smart? I don't think anyone answered that one, but that could be interesting. <laughs> How does that make you smart? I always, I always say some shows make me dumber, right? So <laughs> anyway, okay. So yeah, and then we've got some more vocabulary practice and things down here that we could look at. But what we're going to do next is we're going to take a look at a reading. So if I zoom out here, uh, we have a reading that we're going to look at. Um, and this reading uh, comes from a book by a lady called Sharon Draper. Uh, it's called Out of My Mind, okay? and Rachel, okay, cool. Thanks, thanks, Rachel. Nice. So we've got this uh, story called Out of My Mind in a segment of this story. Uh, and we've got this girl here and you can see she's in a wheelchair. Uh, do you notice anything specific about the picture of her in her wheelchair? If I just zoom in slightly like this, anything specific that you notice? Her hands, what about her hands? What about her hands specifically? Stiff, yeah, maybe. The position of her hands, yeah, okay. Looks animated, looks twisted, okay, yeah. So not like maybe how we would normally have her hand, it kind of looks more at an unusual kind of flexing of the fingers, right? Try and introduce other words to my students as we go. Yeah, okay, maybe her hands, she doesn't have control of her wrist, maybe. You think she has a disability, Edward? Okay, so why, and again, we could talk about all of these factors, right? We could try and figure out some more things about this, okay? Great, but then we have uh, a reading here. Now, 
So we think maybe she has a mental disability, possibly, right? Uh, now we have a reading. Now this reading is reasonably long. Um, we're not gonna go over all of it, um, but I will introduce you to some of the pictures that will help us tell the story, okay? But what I do want to do is I do wanna focus on a few pieces of it, okay? Um, so I think the easiest way to do this one uh, is probably, if I just move some things out the road here, uh, is if you just read it, because you can probably read it faster than I can say it, right? Just read through. Uh, I'll scroll down in a minute. But just read through the text really quickly. You don't have to understand everything. Just, just quickly um, scan through it, read through it really quickly. You will notice that some of the things you've already read are here. We've already um, read a few of these pieces uh, in those activities I did earlier. Okay, I'll scroll down a little now. Okay. And I'll go down a little more to the bottom. Okay. Right, so from what you've read there so far, very quick reading, right? What ideas are you getting from the text so far? What, what are we understanding from the text here? So what's this about? It's about a girl called Melody, right? What, what other things could you say about what we've read here so far? She needs constant support, okay. She has a special ability to memorize things, cool. She's cool. She's frustrated, okay. She's lonely maybe, yeah, okay. She's got a photographic memory. Physical disability, but mentally she's a genius. People see her disability, but maybe they don't see the rest of it, right? Yeah, she's, she does have cerebral palsy, yes. Intelligent with a disability, okay, good. Okay, so she's, she's interesting in this way, right? Now, I wanna focus on this last paragraph down here. I'll just um, look at this last little piece. I've seen dozens of doctors in my life all who all try to analyze me and figure me out. None of them can fix me, so I usually ignore them. I paste on a blank look, right? Focus on one wall and pretend the questions are too hard for me to understand. It's sort of what they expect anyway. How do you feel about that behavior that she's describing? You feel she's smart? Why, why do you feel she's smart? People look at the outside, but she's smart on the inside. Yeah, maybe, right? She maybe doesn't wanna trust doctors anymore, yeah? She's sort of giving up, maybe, protecting herself, yeah? She's just cooperating, just going along with it, yeah? You feel sad for her, yeah. So again, we could talk about all of these things and how she behaves and maybe why she does that and how she feels about it. And, you know, we could relate it to you and things like this, right? But in the interest of time, because we're already halfway through our webinar here, we're gonna move forward a little bit. Um, and I want to focus on a couple of little things here. So let me zoom out, go to the next page. And here you can see uh, Melody does a test with a doctor, okay? She goes to see this doctor called Dr. Hugely. Um, and as she says here in the thing, yeah, she's not making it up. He's a really big man whose name is Dr. Hugely. Um, and she's going, he's getting her to do a test, okay? Um, so I wanna focus on a couple of questions here. Uh, okay, so down here, he asks her a question. He says, number one, which of these is not like the others? He showed me pictures of a tomato, a cherry, a red round balloon, and a banana. I knew he was probably looking for the balloon as the answer, but that just seemed too easy. So I pointed to the banana because the first three were round and red and the banana was not. Dr. Hugely sighed and scribbled some more notes. Okay, so here's the, this is exactly what's going on in this picture. Here's, here's the test he's given her, which one is different? How do you feel about that question and what Melody does? She says he probably wants her to point to the balloon, but she thinks that's too easy. So she points to the banana. What do, you, what do you think about that? Pretty smart. She is still right. Yeah, okay. Every brain doesn't work the same way. Nice, perspective. You can see yourself doing that, yeah? Yeah. 
She's thinking outside the box, outside the square. She's got critical thinking. Nice, right? So different things. Now, if you look at these pictures, if I just zoom in a little more, here's the four pictures. If I asked you which one is different, um, could you give me a reason why one of those is different? So I could say, well, the banana, because it's yellow and it's not round, which is what Melody said. Okay, what else could you say? You could say the balloon because it's not edible, sure. Okay, what else? Okay, the rest are fruit. Okay. Ah, he's got one. She says cherries because there's two of them and everything else there's only one. That's interesting, right? Yeah. Okay. Maybe, maybe you could say the tomato because some people say, is a tomato a fruit or a vegetable? <laughs> right? It's like, is it a fruit or is it a vegetable? How does that work, right? Um, whereas, whereas the others, they're definitively fruits or a balloon is a balloon, right? I don't know, right? Whatever. You could maybe come up with a reason why each of them is different, perhaps, right? So, hmm, interesting, okay? Cool. Um, so, yeah, yo. Yeah. Uh, what was the doctor's answer? The doctor was looking for a balloon, which is what Melody thought in the beginning, right? Mm, interesting. Now, there's another question here. Let's go up and find uh, this one. Oh, sorry, down the bottom of the page here to start. Okay. Uh, number two, he says, he showed me four more cards. This time, there were pictures of a cow, a whale, a camel, and an elephant. Which animal gives birth to a calf? Which animal gives birth to a calf? And then up here, oh, sorry, I'm gonna scroll up. Now I know for a fact that all the animals he pictured here have babies called a calf. What to do? I hit each picture slowly and carefully, and then I did it once more to make sure he understood. I don't think he did. I heard a mumble cow as he wrote some more notes. Okay, interesting, right? Yeah. So how do you feel about this one? The doctor is stupid, says Rachel. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, true, right? Interesting. Okay. Actually, I wasn't sure. I, I knew about I knew about the whale. I knew about the camel. I wasn't sure about the other one, right? Yeah. The doctor's getting impatient, right? Yeah. Okay. Now, um, what happens in the rest of the story? We're not going to read it because we don't have time. I want to do a couple of other activities. But what happens here is uh, the doctor ends up talking to mom. Right. And he basically says, your daughter is uh, cognitively uh, impaired. Um, she's psychologically damaged. She can't operate in society. And her mom gets really, really angry. And her mom says some specific things. So her mom says things like, um, I know she's bright. I can see it in her eyes. Right. And her mom also says she laughs at jokes right at the punchline. Her mom sees Melody's reaction and interprets that as intelligence, right? But she can't um, see other ways that her daughter is smart, perhaps, right? And then down the bottom here, her mom gets really, really angry, right? Um, her mom says, I think you're wrong. I know you are. Melody has more brains in her head than you'll ever have, despite those fancy degrees from fancy schools posted all over your walls. You've got it easy. You have all your physical functions working properly. You never had to struggle to be understood. Um, all of us who have our faculties intact are just plain blessed. Melody is able to figure things out, communicate and manage in the world when nothing works right for her. She's the one with true intelligence. So maybe that goes back to Einstein and being able to adapt, right? Interesting, right? Yes, mom, says Rachel. <laughs> Fight for your daughter, right? Yeah, okay. So yeah, so there's some different things we could think about uh, this situation right and actually if you read the book or if you go find out about this book it's really interesting what happens to melody through the rest of this book because this is only a very small piece of the book right yeah cool but anyway what we want to do is um we're going to because obviously reading this would take some time but i want to go on and look at a couple of the activities that follow up to do with the analysis here okay so we want our students to understand what's going on um and uh analyze what's happening in the text, right? So for example, um, number one here, it says contrast. How does the doctor's evaluation of Melody's cognitive abilities differ 
from Mrs. Brooks' evaluation, Mrs. Brooks is Melody's mom, right? So what do you think is the difference between, I, I described it very quickly, but what do you think is the difference here? How do we contrast these two? Different perspectives, okay. They've got a different way of looking at her intelligence, true, or a cognitive ability. One is clinical and one is interpersonal, true. Could be, right? Yeah. You could also say maybe Melody's mom is using a behavioral measure, right? How does Melody behave rather than how does she answer a question, right? Which could be one. So she laughs at the jokes and she tries to figure things out, right? Yeah, okay, cool. So there's a, yeah, a different, yeah, you said a wrong understanding of intelligence, Arlene, and maybe it's not wrong, maybe it's just a different perspective, right? I, I hesitate to say things are right and wrong, right? But there are definitely different perspectives, right? Yeah, okay. Yeah, the mother looks the daughter in the eye, the doctor just looks at how she answers the questions, right? But also, how good is the doctor's measure? How good is the doctor's test, basically, right? Yeah, a one-time assessment versus a long-term observation, says Jiao Wei. How much do it, does that happen in our schools? <laughs> how much does it happen with your students? You know they're smart, they just don't do well on the test, right? Mm, yeah, okay, cool. Um, We'll, we'll jump a couple of these. Number three, explain. Reread the lines here. It says, why does Melody's mother ask, you think you're smart because you have a medical degree? Why does Melody's mom ask that? Is that really a question? Does she expect an answer? Or is it rhetorical, right? Yeah, okay, it's more, yeah, it's more of a statement, right? Yeah, she's getting annoyed, totally, right? Yeah, we can see that in her voice, perhaps. Cool. Okay. Um, and then, uh, yeah, and then we could look at some of these other ones. Maybe this last one, infer. Why do you think the author titled this book Out of My Mind? Yeah, sarcasm, definitely, right? So, Out of My Mind. Why do you think it's Out of My Mind? Why do you think the title of the book is Out of My Mind? It's a contradiction. Okay. I'm like, my mind is in here, the rest of me is out there, I'm out of my mind, maybe. Out of the ordinary, maybe. Going out of my mind, in other words, I'm going crazy because ah, I just can't deal with this, right? This is too difficult, right? It's a paradox, maybe, yeah. So we could talk about lots of different reasons, right? And think about um, what is, is there a message in the title? Um, maybe it's actually part of the book, maybe we figure that out later as part of the book, right? Yeah. OK, but then now that we've done this orally, there is actually an activity. Um, Dr. Hugely suggests that Melody belongs in a special school for students who have a developmental difficulty. Melody's mom actually puts her in regular school later on, as, as what happens in the actual book. Um, but then how would we answer this question and what evidence would we cite? So here we're teaching the students a skill, right? We want you to answer a question, but then we want you to say why. Where is the text evidence that says this? Okay, so if we use that example really quickly and just jump back, uh, let's see. Okay, he talks about it over here mm, on the right hand side. Here we go. So he says, um, Okay, you can choose to keep her at home or you can send her to a special school for the developmentally disabled. There aren't many choices here locally, he gives mom a brochure. But the question, if I jump back to the question here, was, uh, oh, back on the left-hand side, was why does he think Melody might belong in a special school? So what's the evidence we could point to that says he thinks Melody needs to be in a special school? It might not be on this page, it might be on the prior page as well. Due to her physical inabilities, maybe, right? Maybe it's due to that. Now, where does it say that? Where does the doctor see that in the text? Actually, he does see it in one place because um, here, uh, uh, line 45, he brings out a stack of wooden blocks and he asks Melody to stack them by size, but she can't do that because she's got cerebral palsy, right? So maybe that is, that is one reason and we could cite that instance as an example, right? Yep. Um, uh, because she's not as smart as he thinks, right? About, yeah, so specifically there are where he's, she's, she's getting the questions wrong in his opinion, 
right? And therefore he thinks she's cognitively uh, challenged, right? Uh, in that way, the balloon and the cow, totally, right? Yeah, so again, we could get our students to cite uh, pieces of evidence to actually go and quote the lines of the text or summarize the lines from the text as a way to point to the evidence um, about those, uh, those reasons why the doctor thinks Melody belongs in a special school. And there are other activities we can do as well with this. Uh, if I just show you another one really quickly, um, there is one, if I go to my OneNote again, uh, in the language companion, the workbook, um, so this is the one we just saw. There is another one as to why Melody's mother believes that Melody is intelligent. And again, we can cite some of the evidence for that question as well. And of course, we could make up other questions um, to ask our students and get them to practice the skill of citing evidence. Okay. But what I want to do right now uh, in the last, say, 10 minutes. Um, oh, okay. So Rachel is asking, what do we write in the answer box? So let's say, for example, let's actually do this one really quickly. Um, why does Melody's mother believe that Melody is intelligent? And so our answer in this one could be, maybe it's, uh, I'm gonna write really briefly, because um, she sees, uh, maybe I say she sees Melody um, exhibit intelligent behaviors. Okay, maybe because we talked about uh, Melody's mom maybe looking at the behaviors, okay? Um, now, what's the evidence that supports this answer? Okay, what's the evidence that supports the answer? Okay, so we could say, for example, what could we say as the example? How, what can we cite from the text? Okay, laugh at jokes, says Glam, Glam right? Okay, yeah, so we could say, um, for example, uh, sorry, I just moved the chat box away, um, Melody's mom, says, and then we can quote the actual lines, right? Uh, so oops, if I jump back to the text, let's find the actual lines in the text. Jump back a page, it's up here. Um, she laughs at jokes, dot, 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 right at the punchline. That's what we want to write. And that's lines 103 and 104, right? So what we can do is we can say over here, we could say she laughs at the jokes. And then even though there's more words in the middle, we can just say dot, 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 because it's mom continuing to talk right at the punchline. And we could say lines 103 to 104, so that someone can go back and look at the thing we've actually quoted and make sure it's actually there. It's always important that someone who's reading what we write can go back and actually say, oh, that's where it is. I can see what you, why you said that, right? Also important if um, we didn't write this, um, we could say, for example, in lines 103 to 104, Melody's mom describes Melody's intelligence by the way she laughs at jokes, laughs correctly at jokes or responds correctly to jokes. So we're summarizing what she says, but we're still referring to the line numbers, okay? And that's one way to do it, okay? Um, now, different teachers and different school systems might have slightly different approaches, but yeah, these are some ways to do it, okay? Nice. If anyone has a different way for that as well, feel free to just drop it in the chat box too, but this is, a, this is one reasonably common way to do that, okay? Nice. Okay, good. So let's uh, quickly go to one last activity in this particular section. So we talk about uh, melody, we talk about some of the ideas, we look at um, there's some grammar in here as well to do with proper nouns and things. And then um, we've also got some ideas about um, how Melody is not just a diagnosis on a medical chart. She's a human being. And what does that mean? Um, but then right down the bottom, one of the last activities here in this short section um, is to create an intelligence test. What do you feel about the doctor's intelligence test? Was it a good test? Was the doctor's test a good test? No. Why not? Let's think critically about why it wasn't. So it was limited. There were only, well, we only saw like three questions or four questions in the test. Um, there was one about the blocks. I think there was one about colors and then the one about the, the banana and orange, sorry, banana and cherries and stuff. And then one about animals, right? What else, what else was there? It's unfair to her ability, true. No variation in the testing, nice. 
It's biased. There was no absolutely right and wrong answer. There was too many shades of gray. Okay. Yeah. So there's a problem here. Now we have a task here um, in option two. This is an activity or a small project for our students to create an intelligence test. Okay. And it's given us an example. It says we want to make it a multiple choice intelligence test. Okay. Um, so let me give you a couple of example questions. And then I'm going to ask you to try and create a question. Okay. Um, for our intelligence test. So I'm going to jump back here. And I've, uh, so here's the task, but what I've got is on a Padlet here. I just need to uh, open my Padlet. Uh, not that one. This one closed accidentally on me before, here we go. So I've got uh, a couple of questions here for my intelligence test. Uh, let me open this. Okay, so here is in the middle of the screen, you can see a question multiple choice question that says, what is a light year? And it's got uh, some answers. Now, does anyone know the answer to this question? The time it takes light to travel from the sun to the earth, the length of time that a part of the earth is lit by the sun in one calendar year, the distance light travels in a year, the time it takes the sun to orbit around the center of the Milky Way galaxy. And everybody is correctly saying C. Yes, a light year is a distance, right? It's not a time period. Nice, well done. You are intelligent, congratulations. Okay, <laughs> Okay. now does, does this question seem fairly uh, standard? Is it useful? Is it limited? Is it, is it good? Is it a good question? What do you think? And we could talk about this. And the reason I've done this in Padlet, if I was doing this with my class, is I would get my students to vote using the little star icon at the bottom here. They could vote for how good they think this question is, right? Okay. Um, Ellen, we'll come back to your question on that one in a minute. It's a good question, though, right? Okay, cool. Now, what I'm going to do is here's a different question down here. Um, what is the difference between a dolphin and a shark? Dolphins don't have pectoral fins, and sharks do. Sharks give birth to live young, and dolphins don't. Um, sharks breed using gills, and dolphins don't. Dolphins use sound to detect prey animals from afar, and sharks don't. Okay, target age group, uh, Odin age group for this one is like 12 to 15 years old. This level would be like 12 to 13 years old. Okay, people are saying DDD. Okay, someone says C, can read. Someone's saying all are differences. Okay. Okay, now we could talk about like what the, what the actual answer is. Actually, the answer to this one is C. Uh, dolphins don't have gills, uh, sharks do. And both sharks and dolphins do use sound to detect their prey, okay? Um, and B is confusing because some sharks give birth to live young and other ones don't, others lay eggs. So it's interesting, right? But anyway, um, it is true though that the common knowledge is that sharks detect prey through, um, through blood. Um, and they can, but the thing is not everything's bleeding when they hunt it, right? So they do they do detect through other means as well. But anyway, how about the question? How do you how would you rate this question? And with our students, we could talk about the fact, well, this is not just a question where you have to understand the animals, but you have to understand a whole lot more vocabulary in here. Like what is a pectoral fin? What what is a pectoral fin? What is that? It's the fins on the side that they used to steer with, right? Um, what are gills, right? Um, what's a prey animal? And so there's other vocab items in there that our students have to understand. And if they do understand them, that's also displaying intelligence um, to be able to understand different words and the meanings, right? So, okay, we could talk about the qualities of a good question, right? Um, and things like this, a test within a test, exactly, Rochelle. Um, but what I'd like you to do is to have a go at writing a multiple choice question. Now, the way I want you to do this is you're not going to write on the Padlet. Don't use the chat box. I want you to use the Q&A feature. OK, the reason I want you to use that is because all of those are more easily visible to me and then I can show them up later. Right. Um, if you do it in the chat box, everything's going to disappear too quickly and we won't be able to catch all the questions and answers. OK. Um, but if you use the Q&A box, try and write a multiple choice question for an intelligence test, maybe a little bit like one of these two I've got on the screen. Okay. Can you make a multiple choice question? It doesn't have to be a complicated one. 
Uh, Yanda, that whole point about do we want multiple choice to test IQ, let's just not even go there. Um, <laughs> let's just keep it simple and say we're making a multiple choice question. Okay, so Cherry's put one in. Um, Cherry said, what is um, Oumuamua? Oumuamua? Okay. Uh, Marie's put in, what is the difference between a turtle and a tortoise? Okay. How many sides does a triangle have? Gary, it has five. <laughs> Am I right, Gary? Anyway. <laughs> um, okay. But try, when, if you were doing this, I would want you to put the answers as well. I want you to put down what the possible answers are. Okay. Gary, why did I say a triangle has five sides? Why does a triangle have five sides, Gary? Okay, how many planets are there in our galaxy? Wow, yeah, exactly, Gary. It's got an inside and an outside as well. <laughs> Very good. You could say it has a left side and a right side, maybe. I don't know, right. anyway. Okay. Okay, so Cherry's, what is Oumuamua? It's a comet, an asteroid, or a spaceship? Interesting. I think it's a it's an asteroid, wasn't it? That they thought might have been a spaceship, and it came through our our solar system at a strange angle from somewhere else in the galaxy. Now that now that you've given me the answers, I remember what the word is. Right. Nice. Right. Okay. But this is what we could do with yeah. So some of these are general knowledge. That's true, Gary. But sometimes um, maybe with a question. It's, it's an understanding more about the, the idea behind the question and what it might be. So here's, a, here's an interesting one. Um, I'm just going to, uh, let's, let's do this. So I'll just put a dot and go send. Um, because I want, uh, you can see it maybe in the answered uh, section here. Um, there's a question about how many islands in the Philippines, right? Um, and this is an interesting one. 7,000, 1,700, 1,000, or it depends when the tide is low or high, right? And so immediately when you start thinking that, it's like, okay, you're interpreting those answers and maybe it leads you to a different answer, right? And I think everybody's going with the high and low tide idea, right? Which is interesting. Um, so yeah, but this is how um, we can display our intelligence by the type of answer we give to some of these questions or the way we interpret the questions, right? So sometimes it might not be like, I, it's not general knowledge how many islands are in the Philippines, but we can interpret it and we can try and figure it out, right? And maybe that's displaying intelligence, right? Yeah, okay, cool. So yeah, so these are some ideas about how you could do, do this with students. Um, and, uh, another good one, another, not a complicated one, but a, a fairly simple one here. Um, examples of types of planets are, which, which are um, examples except, right? So Mars, Jupiter, Earth, atmosphere, right? And you could say, okay, so now we just need to understand the different words, right? It's a vocabulary one, okay? Cool. So lots of different things we could do, but I think you can see if I was doing this with my students, we could do it on paper. Um, if I wanted to do it digitally, I might get my students to create a Padlet with some questions. And then maybe we could, as a class, vote on each other's questions and see which are good ones. Maybe we can actually get other students or other classes to do the test and then see if, you know, does, does, it, does it show the intelligence we think these people have or is this test not good? Is it not a valid test? Okay, cool. So yeah, just to give you some ideas about that anyway, but. Um, different things you can do uh, to help the students understand this idea about measuring intelligence and maybe how difficult it might be. Okay, great. So I hope that was interesting today. We will wrap up uh, things now. I'm going to jump back to here, um, but I hope you found that interesting, uh, taking a look at this um, webinar on what makes a person smart using the Lyft program. Um, just a little bit of quick housekeeping and then we'll do some Q&A because I remember Ellen had a good question that we want to talk about. Um, we will send a recording link and a certificate to you tomorrow uh, that will come in your email by about lunchtime. Um, and we do have one more webinar coming up next week uh, for our March webinars and our April webinars will uh, get posted up uh, within the next six or seven days. Um, we'll post up all of April. And so you'll be able to see all of those, but everything you can find is on our webinars page here. 
um, so, oops, excuse me. Um, so here at uh, Asia, ngl-asia.com slash webinars, okay? Uh, and Kitty's dropped a couple of links into the chat box for that. Um, the Lyft uh, program site, if you want to find out more about the program, we will send out some information to you um, in the email as well. But if you would like to talk to one of us specifically, a little bit about more um, with the things you're looking for, um, just answer yes to this question. If you answer no or don't answer, we won't contact you further. But if you answer yes, I'll drop you an email and we can have a bit of a chat about um, how some of these things might help you or other needs you might have, okay? Great. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna knock off uh, some of these other questions here. And I just wanna see, does anyone have any questions that they want to quickly go over? So in the chat box or on the Q&A, um, feel free to drop a question in and I will try to answer for you. Alan, you had a question earlier, which I can't find now. Alan, could you ask your question again so I can uh, help answer it for you? You love Melody already, nice. Yeah, I think we all do after this one, right? Cool. Uh, Marlo, about the recording, I will send the link uh, to the recording to you tomorrow. And yes, it can be downloaded. Uh, this will also go up on our YouTube channel. Um, so the uh, the recording and, and on our webinars page, actually, in our past webinars. Um, and it, it is possible to, to get the recordings from there. Okay, nice. Um, someone's asking about Japanese students for intermediate level. Yeah, um, if you answered yes to the question uh, in the poll here, we can we can chat about that. Just ask us. Um, or you can email me. Um, you've got my email because it's in the webinar notifications. Um, so if you're looking for particular ideas for students, then um, get in touch with us and we'll make sure you get in touch with one of the local uh, National Geographic Learning people to help you with that sort of thing. Okay. Ah, Jawai, yeah, thank you. So Ellen's question was about maybe a bit too challenging. Um, it depends on the background of the students, right? And this is always the judge of how much support do we need to put in um, to uh, help our students access different levels of material, right? Um, this material, in my experience, is okay for students who are at a, uh, you know, their first language is, say, Japanese or Chinese or Thai or something, right? And they're learning English, but they've been learning English for quite a while. They will read English books, right? They will read a novel in English. Um, Maybe they won't understand everything, but they're able to work their way through a novel. Um, and reading and working with this kind of material, if I give them enough scaffolding, and if I give them enough support, then yes, they can access it. They can, they can comprehend what's going on. But I admit it does take quite a bit of time. This is why we said this program is like minimum six hours a week of, of English study. And in some places it might be as many as 10 hours a week, right? Um, so you do need to put quite a bit of time and energy into helping your students access some of this material, as you would if students were uh, doing this as an English medium instruction program in, say, New Zealand, which is where I'm from, right? Um, we would still be spending a lot of time on these tasks and activities, right? Um, it is possible to adapt it, Diana, yes, right? Yeah, very nice. Cool. Okay, let's see, I'm just looking through. Um, so, Alan, I hope that answers your question there. Uh, great. Yeah, and I, I agree, as, as a couple of people have said, this is a, a set of material which is at probably the highest English level that we offer in terms of educational materials. We have a range of materials which are at different levels. This is the top end or the most academic, the most close to first language user of English kind of materials in this age group, right? Um, we have other materials, obviously. Um, and if you look at some of the other programs uh, and go look at some of our old webinars for something like uh, time zones or impact um, or close up, new close up, these are other programs for this age group, which operate at a, at a, a different language level um, that might be more accessible to different students. Okay, great. Nice one. Well, thank you, everybody. I hope that's been really interesting. Yeah, middle years program, I think, Alan, this would um, 
work quite well for, for IB or for students studying an American curriculum or Australian curriculum or something like that, um, it would be quite good for this as well. Um, Aloha has asked a good question. Do we have a webinar about scaffolding in writing? Now, Aloha, if you're still here, um, is this for an EFL student or is this more for a, a more like a bilingual student who's getting ready for writing short essays and things like this, right? There is a difference there. Um, ESL students, okay. Um, there are some webinars that we have um, in the recordings. So if you go to um, uh, ngl-asia.com, I'm just typing in the chat box again, um, webinars, and you go and look at some of the recordings, um, there are some things about developing writing skills for students at a variety of levels and a variety of ages. Uh, so maybe check some of the recordings there. Um, and if you don't find what you're looking for, um, then maybe get in touch with us and we can see if we can put one of those on the calendar for sometime in April or May, perhaps to help you. Okay, great. Well, thank you, everybody. I hope that's been interesting today. Um, we'll sign off now, let you get away and enjoy the rest of your day. Um, as I said, the recording and the certificate will come out tomorrow uh, before lunchtime, your local time. And the April schedule, Mayan is asking, the April schedule is coming out um, middle of next week, okay? Um, we know what it is, but we're just getting the, the materials together to go onto the website for that one, okay? Um, so we have a range of webinars again in April. I'm more than happy to see you come along to all of those as well. But until then, we'll catch you all later and enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, everyone.